Okay, everyone, we're going to move to breakout rooms now. You're going to have 10 minutes to tell everyone your favourite colour and to describe what animal you would be if you lived in the jungle. After 10 minutes, we'll come back to the main room where we'll reflect on your answers. Bye-bye, everyone. Breakout rooms, what do you think of them? As a workshop organiser, I, I love them. I get to send people into a room for 10 minutes to have a discussion. They get to talk to each other. I get a little bit of breathing space as well. As a workshop participant, I hate them. I just can't. Getting shoved in a room with strangers for 10 minutes to discuss something, it just doesn't work for me. And so as someone who's a very reluctant breakout room participant, I've come up with five tips to make your breakout rooms a little less painful. Number one, the first thing I do when I do a breakout room is I give people a clear task. Not a kind of go and introduce yourself task, something specific. They have to discuss something, come up with an answer, solve a puzzle. There's a clear written out task and I give them very clear instructions for that. Very often that will be tied into something like a Padlet. And if you've not come across Padlet, it's an online whiteboard that people can contribute to. So I give each breakout room a link to a Padlet. That means that they're all working on a collective task together. So it gives them something to focus on and discuss. And if they're using a Padlet, then it also avoids them having to stare into the eyes of someone they've never met before. They can all be looking at the Padlet uh, while they're having their discussion. So tip number one, give people a clear task to work through in their breakout room. Tip number two, this follows on from number one. So let's say we're giving people a task. Well, tip number two is to give very clear instructions as to what is about to happen. Whenever I'm giving my Zoom room or team room instructions, I work on the assumption that a third of people are paying attention. A third of people are half paying attention. And another third, well, they're probably not even there. They're making a cup of tea or something. So I repeat instructions three times. And I also have written instructions I copy and paste into the chat box. So people know exactly what they are going to do when they move to the breakout room. The instructions also include appointing someone to feed back into the main room if that's something that's going to happen. Otherwise, people will come back and they'll all stay silent. So tip number two, give people clear instructions. Repeat them several times, paste them in the chat box and let them know any of the tasks they need to do. It's all about setting expectations for when people move into that room. Tip number three, allow people not to join the breakout room. So when I'm sending people to breakout rooms, I always have a little caveat that I say. I say, um, when you move to the rooms, it would be great if you're able to turn on your camera, turn on your microphone and join in with the conversation. If you'd rather not do that, you can still use the chat box to join in with the discussion. But also don't feel obliged to contribute at all. If you would rather just sit as an observer and listen into the conversation, you're more than welcome. In fact, you don't even have to move to the breakout room at all. I will be staying in the main session. You are perfectly uh, free to stay in the main session with me. I do encourage you to move to the breakout room and to join in, but please do what you feel most comfortable with. So tip number three is to give people the option to opt out. Actually tell people that they have permission not to join in with the discussion so they don't feel pressured into joining a conversation that they don't want to have. Number four, have a minimum size to your breakout room. And that minimum size is four. I always have four or five people per breakout room because it's small enough that people aren't intimidated by addressing a huge number of people. But it's also large enough that if one or two of those people don't want to contribute to the discussion, they don't have to. I'm not a fan of paired working in breakout rooms because a pairing is very intensive, particularly with someone that you've never met before. So by having room sizes of four or five, it makes sure that people can opt out. They can listen into the conversation, but they don't have to be leading the conversation if they don't want to. And number five, keep people safe and secure. And there's a few ways that you can do this. I would recommend that all Zoom meetings and events start off with a code of conduct. Paste that into the chat box at the start. Tell people how you would expect them to behave and interact. What language, what terminology is acceptable, what is not. This helps people know what to expect during the session. Remind them of the code of conduct when they move into the breakout rooms. 
if possible, and you have enough helpers, put one helper in each of your breakout rooms. So there's someone there to facilitate and monitor the conversation. If you don't have that, let people know what they should do if they're made to feel uncomfortable at any point. By addressing these things, it's not saying that you are likely to encounter them, it's just letting people know that if a problem does arise, there's a perfectly set out process by which they can get in contact with you and that you will deal with the problem. So set out your expectations right at the start of the session as to how people should behave. When they're in the room, particularly if you're dealing with sensitive topics or vulnerable people, have someone to help facilitate and support that breakout room. If that's not an option, make sure people are aware of how they can feed back to you if there's a problem raised. And so those are my five top tips for a breakout room. Have a task, have clear instructions, allow people to opt out, have a minimum size to a breakout room and have a code of conduct and let people know how to raise a problem. And hopefully if you do those five things, people should feel a lot more comfortable in the rooms that you've created. Hope they go well. Now let's find out what animal people think they are. Welcome back everybody. Hello.